Hello and Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to another episode of Legum Impact Program Series. Uh, my name is Brad Ahmed and today's discussion will delve into the significant impact of media on various legal rights and the implications it holds in our society uh, and how media coverage can implement can influence public opinion, right to fair trial, uh, right to freedom of expression, uh, right to privacy and, and dignity. In the modern age, uh, there is no denying the fact that media has emerged as a powerful uh, means, not only uh, to exercise but also to promote uh, fundamental rights and is playing a very significant role of uh, the fourth pillar uh, of the modern uh, state. Uh, for uh, this discussion today, uh, we have been joined by uh, Barrister Mehrun Nisa Sajad. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am, for being here. Thank you for having me. It's absolute absolute pleasure. Uh, starting our discussion, ma'am, uh, we know how informed a citizenry is essential and pivotal for uh, you know uh, holding governments accountable for making informed choices and decisions and overall uh, you know participating in public affairs which constitute as a um, cornerstone of democratic uh, societies so my question is that how and to what extent pakistani media industry is playing its role uh, in regards to right to information uh, which is guaranteed under uh, article 19a of the constitution so essentially article 19a of the constitution gives this right to every ordinary citizens that any public body of the federal government um, uske jitne official records hain, those can be made available on request and must be made available on request hmm. to ordinary citizens. Now in this the media obviously also has a very important role to play in terms of disseminating relevant information yeah. to the citizens and also the media can also be a, an initiator of re such requests filed for information. Right. Um, to answer your question to what extent the media is doing this at present, um, I mean it, it of course it, it is doing its job to a certain degree when it comes to keeping citizens aware of what is happening. But the important thing to look into is that is the media only making selective information available to citizens, um, information that perhaps falls in line with the agendas or the narratives of the given government at that mm. particular mm. time or certain other higher authorities that dictate the media. Is the, or is the media acting independently and in the interests of the citizen? Um, unfortunately, the reality of Pakistan and um, the way that there is no separation of powers in Pakistan that has translated into um, a system where oftentimes if the media is bringing information to light against a particular person or a particular party, this often only happens when the government of that time or the higher powers as it were uh, in play at that time want to demonize that particular party, that particular person or that particular institution in the public's um, kind of perspective at that point in time. So, tab hum ye dekhte hai ki media bohat active ho jata hai in bringing this information to light. But when it comes to, to answer your question simply, no, I don't think they are performing their duty um, in, in a very objective way because you see the media has to be completely detached from any kind of politicization. Um, as a journalist, as a media channel, as a media group, your duty to the public and to your viewers is to remain objective from all the madness and chaos that surrounds you mm. and to report only facts. Yeah. But are we doing that? That is the thing that we have to ask ourselves or what are we just reporting things that we know are going to get the maximum number of clicks or the maximum number of views? Are we actually having debates and discussions on important matters of public policy um, when elections are approaching are we really having a lot of discussion into say the economic policy that is offered by each party are we dissecting their manifestos or are we inviting people from a particular parties that we know are going to sit and create some kind of political drama mm -hmm. which is going to be sensationalized yeah. blown out of proportion and then reported yeah and also media uh, you know outlets act as watchdogs uh, you know uh, monitoring governmental policies des decisions and activities and obviously through reporting they bring transparency to public affairs uh, like exposing corruption abuse of power and violation of uh, rights but as you have uh, rightly pointed out that all of 
uh, this can be materialized only when there is impartiality, objectivity uh, in media reporting without, you know, political biasness. And also, um, that is because we are witnessing that public perception has been made in this regard that um, uh, these mainstream channels have uh, political affiliations with this or uh, that uh, political party and even anchors for that matter. And obviously that is premised on the way they are, uh, you know, projecting facts uh, in a certain way or, um, you know, giving nuance to it. Uh, so my question, as you have, you know, um, covered uh, it uh, in uh, in the first question, but I would like to, you know, ask this question specifically: that do you believe that Pakistani uh, media outlets ensure to its citizens these essential uh, principles of impartiality, objectivity, and uh, you know, no political biasness? And uh, if not, what uh, adverse impact they impart on the society overall? So obviously you can't generalize, right? Yeah. But largely, unfortunately, the case is that when there is money involved, mm. um, there is no impartiality on part of the media. Okay. And we have seen this that even um, some media channels are run by highly influential people who do not keep, uh, who do not, you know, it's it's no secret that they have mm. political affiliations. We also know, is um, there's two layered responsibility. One yeah. is responsibility on the media itself, but then it's also the government. Yeah, so the government, when you are closing down channels without warning, when you are not following the due process that mm. is prescribed in the law, to regulate the content that is aired. But without warning, you are shutting down news stations, you are going after a particular journalist when they fall out of line with the narratives that you want propagated, and that's hugely problematic. True. And this is a problem that, and I mean, I think um, the Pakistan Broadcaster Association and the All Pakistan Newspaper Society, they um, Recently, they published a statement condemning all forms of coercion by any government, past or present, where they have used government um, advertising as a tool to influence uh, editorial policy. So essentially, what the government is doing then is by, you know, it's a carrot and a stick approach. You're either punishing them for not pursuing the agenda that you want them to, or you are incentivizing them to dictate your narrative. Um, and you know this is done, we've seen journalists being harassed, we've seen them being blackmailed, we've seen them being threatened. So I mean despite, it, it, it's, it's very easy for us to sit here and say that uh, media channels should be operating objectively and they should withstand all kinds of pressure but we've seen journalists go to jail. We have recently um, you know also seen Ashad Sharif being mm. killed. Yeah. So in that kind of environment, you are really, really expecting too much from your journalists, True. you know. So end may kya hota hai? End may hota hai ke anyone who is actually driven, even agar wo aate hai into the uh, profession of, you know, media or journalism, very driven by this sense of public service and justice and letting people know what is right, by all the pressure that is put on them and all the influences, eventually they give way. You know, and they're like, why should we make our lives so difficult and our family's lives so difficult? Yeah. So unfortunately, no, it, the media does not exist impartially. And we, we know this, there's another problem here is, and this ties in with the question you asked earlier about their duty under Article 19A. A media, any re fact or news that you are reporting, you have to verify it factually. Yeah, but source. unfortunately, there's a mentality here which is we're driven by a first to market or first mm. to break the news yeah. kind of mentality. And in this race, we are not actually verifying the contents of what we are reporting. True. You know, often, um, if even if they're reporting on proceedings that happen in a court of law, they'll pick out one comment made by a judge or by, you know, someone from the executive that will be taken out of context, it will be twisted. Yeah. And it's kind of like the interpretation that is given to comments or the way that statements are taken out of mm. context, it's, it's almost doing their own job and duty and profession a disservice. Yeah. Because again, this is being done to create the same kind of sensationalism, to, you know, uh, have this dramatic kind of mm. reporting. Uh, without being driven by a purpose to actually deliver proper facts to yeah. people. So, unfortunately, I can't say 
uh, that the media is impartial in Pakistan. Yeah, and I mean, uh, at the end of the day, uh, media is also a corporate entity. And, yes. uh, you know, the TRP mayor is quite problematic as well because uh, they focus on those things which, you know, uh, catches public uh, attention for that matter. And uh, it is so problematic that it can, you know, contribute to societal, societal polarization as we are already witnessing it, like deepening divisions, yes. uh, you know, leading public to, um, uh, uh, you know, they are misguiding public. And uh, obviously it uh, leads to um, erosion of uh, public trust and undermining the democratic pro processes. And they can even, um, you know, uh, they can even be exploited for the pro propaganda as well. Yeah. So my next question is that what sort of uh, regulatory regimen do we have in place um, to keep uh, sort of uh, keep uh, checks and balances on these media outlets uh, in case uh, they evade these essential principles of impartiality and political biasness. So we have PEMRA and the Enabling Act for PEMRA, which is the Electronic Media Regulatory Authority in Pakistan. Um, and the PEMRA ordinance um, kind of is the enabling act for this authority. PEMRA is um, responsible for all the licensing of broadcasters, media channels, etc. And they're also given oversight to kind of monitor the content that they're producing. Um, and if something, if any report or any, um, you know, uh, even a drama, for example, or a film is falling into certain categories, and these are the limits that we have on the freedom of expression, etc. Uh, there are some exceptions that come national security reasons, you know, our, our uh, relationships with mm. other states. Um, statements that threaten the law and security um, situation or general conceptions of morality and also accepted standards of decency. Mm. However, if you see all these standards or benchmarks, they are very subjective yeah. in nature. It's not objective and we've seen them being used as a tool in the past. Mm. And a lot of people actually have said that PEMRA should remain only a licensing authority, right? Yeah. You cannot give the licensing authority the right or the powers to also censor content. And actually, if you look at the spirit and letter of the PEMRA ordinance, that is, it sets up a council of complaints, right? Um, the, if anything, any if PEMRA takes objection to any content that is being aired or they want to take action against a TV channel or a particular anchor person, they have to go through the council of complaints. Mm. They have to verify the content and then on directive of the council of complaints, they can then issue um, a show cause notice or whatever it is and start right. proceedings to censor that. But we've seen that in the past, PEMRA has sidelined this step, right? Mm. Um, you know, the it has a two-tiered regulatory system. First, it is the Council of Complaints, and recently there's a judgment from Justice Mansoor Ali Shah and Justice Aisha Malik, which says exactly this, and they said that PEMRA cannot bypass the Council mm. of Complaints. Right. Um, it cannot become, you know, this all-seeing, all-monitoring kind of, you know, yeah. omni um, authority. It has to go through the Council of Complaints, and you cannot, you can't just censor, um, shows or journalists etc taking what they're saying out of context you mm -hmm. know and in this judgment they go, go it, it's a very good judgment goes into a lot of detail saying that you have to look at what is the message behind something yeah. you can't just say that this drama will not air because it's against morality and mm -hmm. decency in society you have to look at the message of that what is the message that that is sending and also what is a reasonable restriction because that's what the law says you yeah. know you can impose reasonable restrictions, restrictions on these rights so that needs to be defined more specifically exactly. in fact some people have gone as far as saying that pemra the 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 body that looks at complaints made against any content that is aired should be completely separate from pemra hmm. and i actually think that there is wisdom in this because agar aap your regulating authority cannot be the uh, same authority that is judging whether what content goes up and what content doesn't, right? Okay. And that should not be in the purview of the government. There have been suggestions made that um, a, a separate body dealing with content, censorship, etc. needs to be set up, perhaps comprising of a retired judge of the Supreme Court and also have people. The Council of Complaints also actually, its correct constitution envisions this kind of setup that you have people from all different walks of life so that you are 
ensuring diversity of voices and opinions. It's not the same kind of people who are censoring one particular group of ideas. So that is the way that you ensure that there is diversity in the content, that you are doing justice to the marketplace of ideas that actually exist within your society and that you are representative. Mm. Um, and you know, time and time again, people have raised this question that the council of complaints, ke jitne members hain, their vacancies need to be advertised, you need to uh, yeah. put them out in the press, you need to you know, invite people from all walks of life. Mm. But we don't see this happening. In fact, we think that the council of complaints is bypassed, you know, it's become yeah. almost irrelevant. And we see PEMRA taking action without following the due process which is prescribed in the law. All right. Uh, also, ma'am, coming towards uh, my next question, uh, we all know, and especially the law students and legal practitioners for that matter, are very much familiar with the fact that uh, how important and essential and pivotal is the notion of uh, fair trial or the notion of uh, uh, innocent until proven guilty for any judicial, for any, uh, judicial system. Um, and also that accounts for, uh, you know, the way we uh, put trust and credibility or attach uh, credibility to any judicial system. But we are seeing on the other side that, especially in high profile cases or which, uh, uh, you know, uh, catches public attention, uh, there are speculative, you know, headlines, um, there are, uh, you know, a portraying image, image, uh, portraying accused in a specific images which can spare public opinion in a certain direction, uh, even before the actual trial has taken place. Um, so, do you think that, um, you know, such sort of media coverage uh, have uh, um, influence and uh, influence on a right to fair trial or the notion of uh, uh, innocent until proven guilty? And uh, does also uh, it uh, influence the judge's opinion when, you know, when the vast uh, majority of public have found opinion about the guilt of uh, the accused? Okay, so, um, I mean, your judges, by the time they get to a particular point, have received hopefully enough training where they should not be affected yeah. by what is being said by the public or by the media. That is what one hopes for. But that said, I think um, it's a double edged sword, right? Because um, on the one hand, in certain cases, public pressure has perhaps empowered uh, judgments in the right direction. You know, yeah, we see yeah. these uh, this in cases like Khatija Siddiqui. Khatija Siddiqui. We see this in other cases, um, Zainab, case. Zainab case, exactly, where just the public outcry hmm. on social media and media like really pressurize and the fact that there was public scrutiny, yeah. it works out in their favor. But the other side of the flip side of this coin is that oftentimes what you're doing is you are judging people in this kangaroo court hmm. of public opinion. And before the trial has even started, there is a parallel trial running yeah. on Twitter or exactly. on social media or on the news channels. And you know, this is why we have um, legislation like the Contempt of Court Act, which mm. prohibits um, publishing the proceedings of in-camera, you know, um, hearings in court, right? And right. there are some exceptions that you can, you can just report what was said or mm. if there was a remark made uh, by an executive authority, you can report on that, etc. Right. But what we see today is not a fair representation of proceedings that are happening and we see actually um, anchor, uh, you know, TV anchors conducting a trial before the trial has even exactly, commenced. Yeah. Um, and what that does is that taints the public's perception of mm. that person. And in this, this is something perhaps for us to think about that in this age of media, etc. Are we, how are we still beholden to the concept of innocent until proven guilty? Mm. You know, and I mean, it's, it all goes hand in hand, I suppose. One reason that people take to uh, social media or even uh, discussing this on TV is perhaps because people's faith in the justice system in Pakistan mm. is dwindling. It's at an yeah. all time low. Yes. But that said, um, it is it is still important that you let the people who are designated, i.e. judges, to pronounce verdicts on this, let them do their job and you don't do this before that, right? There may be, the media might be reporting particular aspects of a case of information that becomes available to them or that is leaked to them. Yeah. But the entire documentation or the full picture of that case of even facts are not present before the public, hmm. right? So it is not a fair assessment that happens then. It's limited information that you have, but everyone wants to have an opinion. Everyone wants to sound relevant. Yeah. So they all must give their own input. Yes. So I think it is actually quite detrimental also. And recently, I think we've reached 
an all time low where everyone has taken it upon themselves to criticize the judiciary to c criticize judges which is actually prohibited also i'm not saying that they are above transparency or accountability mm. but you have to wait for them to give a, judges can only speak to their judgments yeah. right yeah. um before that you are you know by by decreasing the public's confidence in the justice system you are doing no one any favors yeah. because you know one day this is happening to a particular group tomorrow this can happen against another group where where you know it's it's what we're promoting is law of the jungle yeah. essentially right True. there's there's and this is a problem with like i said social media trials or trials mm. where it's become media so trial. easy yeah. to ruin someone's life or mm. reputation all you have to do is send out one viral tweet and it's picked up by all the tv channels it's reported by them and it's it's not a fair representation often of what is actually going mm. on True. so i think um all these things need to it's it's important to be aware of all of these different ways in which you know and i, I do think that um you know we we the it's not just our legal system it's legal systems around the world they they are based on this principle of innocent until proven yeah, guilty yeah. um and we don't we don't see that happening now in this you know right. new dawn of media etc right and also we see the you know the sensationalized uh, media coverage um, affects the right to dignity and right to privacy as well and it creates a situation you know where any attorney or lawyer for that matter would be hesitant to proceed with the case of uh, defendant uh, owing to the uh, fear of uh, stigma and even after the trial if an accused has been you know declared innocent uh, he lives a life of a convict uh, due to you know the public perception against uh, made against him or her and as far as the influence of judges um, thing is concerned um, the former um, chief justice of pakistan saqib nisar sahab has spent on a very progressive judgment in this regard uh, like he writes in his judgment that although judges has you know this ability to ignore irrelevant considerations when uh, it comes to you know adjudicating a matter pending before uh, them but the mere danger or a uh, risk of prejudice to the you know determination of a matter pending before it is you know sufficient for a law to step in uh to the rescue of uh, uh, the aggrieved person uh like the test has been declared as a substantial uh you know a danger of prejudice to the substitute matter uh and even this is the approach you know adopted by india uk and us as well that judges are not immune from the public uh, perception when uh, there is you know so rampant uh media coverage against uh, the accused uh, and that obviously connects to my next question that uh, in pakistan what law uh, deals with such situation uh, if an uh, you know aggrieved person wants to refrain or abstain media from uh reporting on uh, a specific case so essentially in pakistan um i mean you spoke about the right to dignity and privacy of people and there's a very uh, pertinent thing to mention there yeah. um which is the media disseminating illegal recordings of private citizens hmm. of course if there's something covered in the recording which is of public interest right then they they have a right on the balance of public interest to perhaps comment on that but at the same time there needs to be clarity in the law um and in the regime of law dealing with this that can illegally obtain information be disseminated by the media yeah. so this includes uh pictures or videos that are personal in nature uh be it of a man and his wife be it mm. of a be it a, a phone conversation that someone's having that is of a personal nature that is used to blackmail people and mm. our media is happily disseminating this that is any private conversation any private conversation and this is a big big breach of mm. their right to privacy and dignity of ordinary citizens mm. and often times you see there is nothing substantial in those conversations that True. is ab actionable yeah. right uh 10 recordings mein se do hongi jin mein actually you have unearth some big mm -hmm. you know ploy or thing that is happening behind the scenes but a lot of them there is nothing you are just getting some cheap thrills out mm -hmm. of disseminating that information and exactly. that is very very sad and you know the way that mm -hmm. it tarnishes people's reputation their family life it is it is it is actually appalling and the media is happily taking part in this yeah. um to answer your other question that if a person's um you know uh, reputation is being tarnished of their right to a fair trial is being affected then what do you do so essentially 
we already have laws in place, right? We have the Contempt of Court Act. We mm. also generally, um, the code of conduct that judges are bound by, they are not supposed to take into account any external pressure or influence while making their decisions um, in these things. But I mean, what an aggrieved person in that scenario can do is that they can um, defend themselves in the hearing in court, right? That that yeah. is the, their recourse that they have. Um, other than that, if there is a particular, uh, there is something that is aired that is of particular detriment to them or that is that really violates the law, then they can take this to the Council of Complaints as well. Right. But like I said, that is pretty much a uh, like an irrelevant kind of, you know, uh, authority now. Mm -hmm. And the Council of Complaints has not been empowered the way that the PEMRA ordinance mm -hmm. um, envisioned it to right. operate. Right. right. And also under Pakistani law, uh, such, uh, you know, such matters can be dealt under uh, Article 204 of the Constitution, if, if I'm not wrong. And, you know, Article 204 of the Constitution empowers a Supreme Court and High Court uh, to take any action or punish yeah. any person. Um, uh, who, you know, tends to prejudice the determination of a matter pending before uh, it. Uh, also, ma'am, we are seeing that Pakistan has had a checkered history of uh, freedom of media and press. And considering the importance of media in a democratic setup or uh, um, a means to exercising fundamental rights, we also, so we also see that there is, as you have uh, pointed out uh, as well, that uh, there is a uh, banning media outlets tendency on the part of regulatory body. And uh, the stated reasons or the announced reasons for that range is from um, the government's tech us to you know suppress dissent and criticism uh, on the pretext of public disorder and security to uh, protection of uh, to lack of uh, robust legal protection so my question is that does these uh, tactics hampers the media ability to operate uh, independently and efficiently uh, and does it amount to uh, infringing citizens right to information and uh, uh, freedom of expression Absolutely, because if your journalists and your media channels, which is a pillar of democracy and any democratic society, if they are not being allowed to function freely mm. um, and they are being silenced, they are being censored, their messaging is being interfered with, then what you're doing is you're essentially only disseminating one particular narrative to the public yeah. and that is that is a violation of so many of their rights, mm. right? And that is basically you are setting up the democratic system for failure. Right. Um, and we've seen this. We've seen uh, without warning, like I said before, media outlets have been shut down. Uh, yeah. Channels have been taken off air. Journalists are threatened. They've been forced to resign. Also, this is just a couple of years ago. We had so yeah. many journalists who was who had been in their publications for ages. Their publications dawn was yeah. um, prohibited from um, circulation like mm. so many times. So we have seen this. And what this does is it really contributes to that atmosphere of fear where everyone is feeling threatened and then the only people you have surviving in such a system are people who are just rubber stamping the message that is being fed to them either by yeah. the government or from some other institution mm -hmm. and that is what is being then um, kind of you know dealt out to the public and this again comes to the problem essentially in Pakistan is that no body authority or institution or pillar of the state is allowed to do its job. There, there is a reason that there is a separation of powers in the law. And if you are intermingling all of these, then essentially you may as well say that we are not a democratic state. Yeah. Do away with the free media. Don't have this pretense of being a democratic state. Exactly. Then just have all these institutions and pillars governed by one body mm -hmm. and you say that they'll do what I want. Because yeah. essentially in practice that is what is happening. And it is very, very unfortunate because, you know, journalists have had to bear serious, serious consequences of this. Yeah. We've also seen um, it's not just taking funding away from that TV channel, etc. But we've seen this particularly in um, Balochistan where journalists, etc. don't just not only face this kind of harassment but and censorship, but there's also anti-terrorism proceedings that are started against them. True. You know, and we've had so many of them who have just gone missing or who have just been killed. And then mm. they become a new story themselves once they are murdered. True. So it, it is really like a very, very, there's a lot of fear, I think, that has been instilled in everyone operating within the media industry. 
definitely and i mean uh, limits have and limits will always exist you know um considering uh, media is gaining importance uh, with each passing day and you know um uh, running it unregulated would be quite uh, irresponsible behavior yeah. but you know banning uh, media outlets uh, crackdowns on journalists uh, exactly. is the stark you know reflection of uh, uh, state institutions incapability and inefficiency yeah and it's also i think if you are censoring content based on the reasonable restrictions that mm. are identified in the law and judicial precedent, yeah. that is fine. But we don't see that happening. Mm. We see when it's pushing a particular political agenda or when it's going against the narrative or when you want to stifle any kind mm. of dissenting voices or opposition within yeah. your society, that is when we're seeing all this censorship being activated. Yeah, and even for all intents and purposes, undemocratic minds will always feel threatened by the free speech. And, you know, they try to hide um, their weaknesses by enforcing silence. Like the U.S. has this policy that there should be free speech and not enforce silence. Even if there, if there uh, is a negative speech, why not to counter it through a counter speech? Like, exactly. And then, uh, you know, yeah. the public will then weigh for themselves which argument, uh, you know, holds uh, more, some, sway with more the truth. Yeah. But I think that is what they're scared of. They don't yeah. want to let the public decide. They are so scared that the public will decide against what they want the public to decide. Yeah. So they don't want to even expose them to those ideas mm. um, and actually now it's becoming more and more difficult for them to do this because we have social media exactly. we have independent media outlets we have yeah, podcasts yeah. like this you know yes. we have YouTube where a mm. lot of journalists who faced a lot of severe censorship they've started their own YouTube channels and they're engaging in those discussions over there yeah. but I mean not everyone has the grit and kind of perseverance True. to kind of continue despite such overwhelming odds and threats to their life, their security, their family. So um, so it's it's an unfortunate environment right. overall. Right. Uh, so posing my last question, ma'am, uh, what relation exists between right to information and the right to freedom of expression? Like how do they complement each other? So um, that's a very good question actually that you asked. So I think the freedom of expression is essentially having the right to voice, give voice to your ideas in any mm. manner or form that you deem fit, right? Uh, of course, there are reasonable restrictions and limits uh, within which you can do this. You can't threaten the security of the country or the security forces, information, so on and so forth. But art is freedom of expression. Someone making a movie on a particular topic is their freedom of expression. An artist painting something is also freedom of expression. Someone writing or speaking is mm. also freedom of expression. Yeah. And to have, and you know, it's like having an informed opinion. Yeah. The precondition to that is having the right information available to you. And that is the link between the right to information and the freedom of expression, essentially. That if citizens are being given information that is objective, that is fair, and that is information that they want, then the the more refined their opinions become and therefore this feeds into the expression, right? The, their yeah. freedom to express. Um, and you know, under Article 19A, we also had the freedom of information rules. Mm. So there's legislation on this as well. Um, in This is, I think, 2013 to 14. Only two out of 46 requests that were made for public records um, were received a response. Hmm. I know this for a fact. A couple of female lawyers um, under the Right to Information Act, they wrote to the Supreme Judicial Council asking for information of the number of female uh, lawyers who had been considered for roles in the judiciary and higher judiciary. Hmm. Never got a response. It's been months, you know. Right. And every authority, in fact, every public authority is now mandated by the law to have a, an information officer. Right. Is this being done? No. Was there a budget allocated for the implementation of this legislation? No. Mm -hmm. In fact, you ask, and they've conducted numerous surveys, you ask most um, public bodies, and they don't even know that mm -hmm. this right exists, or this legislation is, exists. And it puts those information officers under a duty to, um, in 21 days, give a response to any request that is made in the yeah. prescribed format, falling within the conditions. Right. But this is not being done. Hmm. So how can you have an informed public when you are 
essentially there are blind spots and when you don't want to give them information yeah. you only give them information selectively when you Which want to exactly when you want to charge them up against a particular cause then yeah. you'll give them information so that you can incite them and mm. they can you know kind of tow your narrative on yeah. any given issue uh, you have definitely highlighted a very important nexus that you know when uh, freedom of exp your freedom of expression would be credible only when you will have access to those cred uh, credible information uh, so I guess this is it for uh, today's discussion. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am, once again for thank coming you. and for this wonderful uh, discussion. Um, I hope you would have uh, enjoyed listening to us. Um, take care and Allah Hafiz.